Okay, here we are. Uh, this is uh, First and Second Peter, the class. First and Second Peter, a message for today's church from, the, from Peter the Apostle. Uh, this is lesson number three in that series, uh, The Meaning of Grace, Submission. And if you're following along in your own Bibles, uh, please open them to First Peter chapter two. So we're going to talk about submission today. Uh, submission is not, you know, not a socially or culturally uh, popular idea in the time that we live in. For example, you know, the United States, it was established through revolution and we pride ourselves uh, on the idea that we have the freedom to say or to do anything that we want to, anytime, anywhere, you know, pretty much. A lot of our entertainment, for example, especially comedy, is based on the ridicule of our leaders. It's a form of rebellion. Whether you like them or not, you, know, you, you, you flip through all the comedy shows and the main subject, the main topic of comedy are leaders, our president, whoever that president is, not just Mr. Obama, but any other president, there's always a lot of ridicule heaped on that person. Uh, and if you look at the movies, so on and so forth, most of our heroes are men and women who defy authority and get away with it. So it's difficult in this culture, in this atmosphere, to cultivate a true Christian culture of submission in this type of environment. Uh, so in his epistle, Peter the Apostle says that the experience of God's grace um, will eventually create a new person in us. A person who feels secure in their salvation. A person uh, who has changes in their lifestyle and changes that include holy habits of living, uh, a greater respect for God, a new way of loving, a different self-image, no longer a sinner, a worldly person, a rebel, but now a royal priest, a chosen person belonging to a holy nation. And I'm, you know, I'm mentioning this very quickly. This is just review, right? We've already talked about this in the first couple of lessons. I'm just kind of packaging it together uh, to give you an idea of where Peter is going. Someone who becomes a Christian becomes a new person and they feel different and they act differently. And so far he's kind of you know, listed some of the ways that uh, this new life affects someone. And the point we're making is the thing that affects us, that you know, brings us into this new life, is that we've been exposed to the grace of God. And God's grace has power. It has power to change us in various ways. So in addition to the things that I've just mentioned, Peter shows that God's grace enables a person to understand and accept that an important part of Christian character is the ability to submit. That's the point that he makes and it's the point that we're going to develop here in the passage that we're looking at. So Peter will show that grace in one's life means that this person is able to submit to all the forms of authority that God has established so that we can maintain order in the world and in the family and in the kingdom of God. There is no order without submission. If everybody's a rebel, there's, there's chaos. Okay? So let's talk about you know, rebellion versus submission, just as a topic before we kind of head into the, uh, into the scripture itself. Uh, the root of a lot of problems is rebellion. Before Adam sinned, wait, before Adam sinned, before Adam, there was rebellion in the heavens. The Bible doesn't give a lot of details, but Jude in, in his epistle tells us in verse six that the angels rebelled in refusing to keep the positions that God assigned to them and they were cast down by God. God assigned angels a certain position. They refused to remain in that position. Some of them did, that was the rebellion, and he cast them down. It was one of these rebellious angels, Lucifer, who in the guise of a serpent tempted Eve, who caused the fall of mankind. He was a rebel and he tempted man to become a rebel as well, to rebel against the authority of God. So the dictionary defines rebellion 
as the refusal to accept authority. You know, in common words, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, when you hear those words come out of somebody's mouth, you know, you're, you're, you're hearing the words of a rebel. Or to defy control by another. Or to oppose authority or government or law. Now aside from the commands in the Bible that we obey God's laws, we're also bound to obey the law and the government of the land, and that gets to be a little tricky. Peter, the apostle, refers to the spirit of rebellion that exists in sinful people who resist every kind of authority and secretly desire to do only what they want to do. A lot of the pursuit of wealth anywhere is usually fueled by the desire. They say, I just, I just want to be independently wealthy. That's code for, I want to be rich enough so nobody can tell me what to do because I got enough money. I don't, I don't have to depend on the government, a company, I, you know. And so Peter explains that God's grace acting in people's lives changes their basic aversion to any kind of authority into one of submission to all forms of legitimate authority. That's the point he's going to make. All right, so let's talk about submission. Uh, the term in the Bible, anyways, that they, in the Greek for submission or submit, is actually a military term which means to place oneself under. It's a willing, a willingness to place oneself under. And it was a military term. You know, a military person sees a group of other military people in varying rank and places himself or herself under the ones that outrank them. There's no debate about this. You know, a private meets a captain. The private isn't, you, know, you salute, no, you salute, no, you salute, no, you salute. You know, no, that's, settled. that's settled in the military. You salute who outranks you. You don't even question it. Now submission includes two actions. You know, like what is, how does it feel? What do I do? Well, two, number one, recognition. The recognition of one's position, whether it's an assigned position or a position based on age or skill or whatever, it's the recognition of that position. You know what position you have. And secondly, and we're talking about biblical submission here, willingness. So submission includes recognition and willingness. Submission is not defeat. It's an act of the will in accepting a role or position or a task. Submission is not slavery. Why? Because slaves don't have a choice. So a slave is, yeah, in submission to the master, but not by choice. That's why it's called slavery. So submission is not slavery because slaves have no choice. Submission is a positive response to, expect, uh, to uh, accept our rightful place, whether that place is first or last. You know, John the Baptist, what did he say about Jesus? He understood, he said, well, he must increase and I must decrease. He understood his position. So we live in an ordered universe an order created by God in order to provide for the greatest human fulfillment and joy. That's, you know, things are the way they are because God wants us to have a joyful life. The problems began when the angels refused to keep their positions in this order. We can only speculate here, but they either wanted to be on God's throne or they refused to serve mankind. And when they were cast down, instead of serving man, because the Bible says that angels are ministers to men, the rebellious angels, instead of serving man, when they were cast down, tried to destroy man. That's what happened. Humans, on the other hand, they wanted to leave their positions. In other words, Adam and Eve, Eve, the temptation, they wanted to be in God's position to know good and evil. And the result, of course, was spiritual rebellion and human sin <clears throat> and the following destruction. 
So after this initial rebellion by man, God established a temporary, here's the important word, a temporary order that had three layers, government, society, family. And he did this to guarantee some form of harmony in this sinful world until Jesus returns when this temporary order will be abolished and a new order will be established never to be challenged again. Remember, we live in a fallen world. God has set certain things in order to help us survive in this fallen world. So people continue to rebel against this temporary order in many ways and cause all kinds of problems. So Peter says that when a person experiences God's grace, that grace neutralizes that rebellious spirit and that person is able to do several things. First, that person is able to recognize the big picture and see his or her place in God's plan. Grace opens your eyes to, you know, oh, this is God's order. We don't see that as sinners. And secondly, grace, according to Peter, um, enables a person to willingly take their place, whatever that is, in order to serve and glorify God. Before we're saved, we want to be God. <laughs> we want to be in charge of us and as much as we can. We want to be God. When we're saved, when we receive God's forgiveness and His grace, our eyes open up and recognize, wait a minute, He's God. I'm the created thing. I'm going to take my place under God where God wants me to be. So rebellion does not glorify God but accepting one's place willingly and profitably, this glorifies God and contributes to peace on earth and the growth of the kingdom. How, how far do you think this church would go if our seven elders were constantly at war with one another? I mean, I've been to those places. I've been in those churches. I mean, you don't have to have seven or 15 elders. I've been places where there were only three elders and one elder was at war with the other two. Nothing happened in that church, nothing. So rebellion, you know, especially in the kingdom, is very debilitating. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of setup here, okay? So in first, P, excuse me, in first Peter, that's it, chapters two and three, Peter reviews how grace means submission in these areas. So let's go to chapter two and begin reading from verse 11. The first thing he says is that grace enables submission to government. Verse 11 and 12. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the days of visitation. So as Christians, he said, they live in the same environment as the pagans do, and therefore they're subject to the same temptations and the same pressures as the pagans. And Peter tells them that as Christians, they are to act in a manner befitting their calling, and in so doing, win the respect of the non -Christian. You know, don't feel bad if you don't win over to the faith all the people, all the non-believers around you. I know Christians that take a personal responsibility for that and they're feeling so bad, well, I didn't convert this person, I didn't get my boss, and somebody at work talked to me about Jesus and I didn't manage to get him in the water. You know, they feel bad about that. And Peter's not saying, you, know, you try to convert every, that's not what he's saying. He said, win their respect. If they can respect you, if they can say, for example, I don't believe what you believe, but I believe that you really do believe what you believe, and you walk the walk, and you talk the talk. I don't believe it, it's not for me, but I can see that you sincerely are a religious person. I mean, you know, that doesn't save their soul, but you have succeeded in at least making a witness, and that's what Peter is saying here. These Christians, the ones he's talking to in the letter, these Christians had left paganism, and they were being criticized by their pagan friends and relatives 
for leaving the old religion. And Peter says that their good conduct may work in such a way as to win these people over to the very religion they criticized and end up glorifying God themselves. That'd be great. So it was especially important to have good conduct because in those days the, the criticism was also coming from the government. You know, Christianity began to be outlawed. Do you, do you see what he's getting to here? Haven't you ever seen that on TV? Those, those seriously ignorant people who uh, from that one of the small churches, you know, they have maybe a uh, attendance of 25 people and they're all from the same family and they go around picketing and carrying signs at the funerals of soldiers, of military people, because the military has a policy about homosexuals and they think, why, we're making a real witness for God you know, by, you know, by criticizing and by shaming and by you know, doing these things to men and women in the military who died for their country. They think well, they get a lot of publicity. But when I see that on TV, I, you know, I smack my head. I said, man, these guys are making us all look dumb. Because people out there are thinking, yeah, that's what Christianity is. Mean-spirited, foolish, ignorant. You know. So this is, what, this is what Peter is saying to that same problem 2,000 years ago. He says, hey, act in, act in a respectful way. So you don't have the pagans criticizing you. So God, he says, authorizes the idea of human government, but he doesn't specify or bless any particular form of government. You know, if your form of government is a king or a governor or chiefs or presidents, one form of government is not more especially blessed than another. Don't get me wrong, one form of government may be more productive for citizens than another. But as Christians, we ought to be able to live under any form of government and still practice our faith. And so Peter shows them that part of this acceptable behavior includes respect and obedience for the, quote, form of government that existed at that time. And what form of government existed at that time? Well, a totalitarian regime called the Roman Empire. You might not like the political party you know, that's in power or the other political party trying to get into power, but trust me, there's nothing like the political power that existed 2,000 years ago. So in verse 13 to 17, he continues, he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, because you, uh, but use it rather as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So how and why are Christians to submit to civil authority? Well, first of all, <clears throat> They submit to civil authority because it has been established by God in order to preserve order in society. And this is regardless of the form or the style that that government takes. Peter says to do so will remove any chance for non-believers to level criticism at Christians. My job is not to have a picket and march in front of the White House because I don't like a particular policy of the government in power. I'm not saying we're not allowed to do that, but I don't see that as my job. My job is to proclaim the gospel. That's my job. And to make a good witness of that. Peter also says that the secret of living under any kind of human authority, whether it's a democratic one like here in the United States, or a despotic one like in Iran, the way to live under any kind of government is to realize three things. One, we're free from God's condemnation and the curse of the true law, therefore we're truly free. The worst thing the government can do to me is put me in jail or kill me. But my soul, my eternal life, it's safe with God at all times. Secondly, 
if we realize that our purpose is to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, not any human kingdom on earth, let the pagans worry about that. Let the non-believers thirst and hunger for power in the temporal world. That's not us. We're here saying, you know, the house is on fire. We're saying, here, come on, come on, get out of the house, get out of the burning house, save yourselves. While the rest of the world is trying to you know, move, buy new furniture and move into various rooms in the house that's burning down. And thirdly, he says, if we realize that we're slaves of God, and so no one can really enslave us, we're already in submission to God. So grace, he says, means that we submit to our human rulers because in doing so, we can carry out our true purpose in life, and that is to serve our heavenly ruler. And so grace enables us, steers us, directs us towards submission to government. Secondly, grace enables submission to our masters. In that day, slavery was the common social connection between employer and employee. Today, in most of the world, there's still places where there is slavery, but in most of the world, slavery does not exist uh, anymore. But Peter's teaching here applies to every relationship where one is in charge and one must report, okay? I mean, I'm looking around and if you're not your own boss, you know, if you're working out at Tinker, you, you can be a G29 or whatever it is, you know, but there's always a G31 somewhere. There's always somebody on top of you, right? Even the president in the system that we has, have, rather, he has to report eventually to the people, doesn't he? The people will elect or re-elect him and in many instances cannot do certain things because the Congress has that power and so on and so forth, checks and balances type thing. So there's, there's always, you always have a boss somewhere. So let's read the way Peter says in verse 218, he says, servants be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. So Peter says that what counts as a Christian is your attitude not the attitude of your boss, to be obedient or compliant to our bosses, managers, so on and so forth, that's our choice. And it's made easier or harder by them, but it always remains our choice. Thankfully, in this country, if you have a boss that's just insufferable, you can go get another job. That's why we're not slaves. We can, you know, even though we may have a great job and make money and so on and so forth, if our boss is just you know, unbearable, we can say, you know what, here's my notice. I'm going to do something else. Verse 19 and 20, he says, For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So the purpose of our attitude is our faith and our desire to please God. If we endure injustice patiently, this pleases God. Not the fact that we're suffering. He doesn't take enjoyment in our suffering. He's looking at attitude. And if we suffer because of our own rebellion, well, Peter says, well, you're just getting what you deserve. No profit there. So the objective in employee-employer relationship is not to win points or rights or concessions, but to please God and win over our boss's respect and ultimately his soul. Remember, we have, we, we have tunnel vision as Christians. We see other people potentially as you know, individuals who are in the kingdom. What can I do to affect this person in, in such a way that they will you know, be sympathetic towards hearing the gospel and obeying the gospel? He goes on in verse 21 and says, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His, uh, in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. And while being reviled, He did not revile in return. While suffering, He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting Himself to Him who judges righteously. And He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now 
you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. So Peter says that the purpose we have been called, and that's to become disciples of Christ, is to continue portraying His example of pure living, of patience in suffering, of soul winning. Jesus had no sin. Well, we can't do that part, but we can strive for that. Jesus was patient in suffering. He did not revile His attackers. Jesus was a soul winner. By His example, we were saved. Is someone else being saved because of our example? That's the point. You know, Christ could have beaten the Jews and the Romans with His army of angels, but instead, through His patience and submission to the Father, He won some of their souls. He won over you know, one of the thieves crucified. He won, over, he won over one of the soldiers who observed how He died. He won over people. So a great example uh, uh, for the day-to-day -day grind of dealing with our superiors in school or work, that the objective is not winning over them, but in winning them over. And the first step towards this is submission. Submission. And then he goes on to say <clears throat> that grace also means uh, submission in the family. So we, you know, we saw government, society, master, slave, employer, employee, now the third layer, which is family. The most intimate relationship is the family, and Peter shows how the spirit of submission works in order, in order to create stability in this area as well. So now we're in chapter three, verse one. He says, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any one of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives. So Peter speaks to those who are married to non-believers, because it seems that there may have been a question as to the Christian woman's role in such a situation. She may have said, well, I know the truth. I'm a saved person. You know, I can't, I'm not in submission to this guy. Come on, this guy, you know, he's not a believer. And what does Peter say? No, this is not the way to, remember I said the tunnel vision? He's just not the way to win him over. The submission of a wife to her husband was a clearly established idea in Jewish culture. But Paul, and now Peter, confirmed that this is God's plan for all married relationships in order to maintain order and peace in the family. So the extra dimension here is that this type of behavior is the only way that a Christian woman will achieve her ultimate goal, that tunnel vision, the salvation of her of her, mate, of her mate. So listen how he kind of goes through it. He says, as they, they, meaning the unbelieving spouse, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. One more. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So here Peter details the character of that submissive wife. Very interesting. First he says she's not spiritually bossy. She's not spiritually bossy. Without a word here doesn't mean, uh, you know, without, no, uh, like the silent treatment. <laughs> I've seen women, you know, their unbelieving husbands, oh, Peter says without a word, and they interpret that as meaning, I'm going to give my husband the silent treatment until he converts. Well, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the, if you do that long enough, he, he won't convert, he'll divorce you. <laughs> that's what that means. <clears throat> without a word means, without showing off her spiritual knowledge or pointing out her husband's spiritual failures. That's what it means. You don't have to talk spiritual things. You don't have to point out their, their spiritual deficiencies without a word in that area. So the question comes back, well, if I don't, you know, if I don't go around teaching him all the time, what do I do? 
How do I win them over? <clears throat> so then he explains, he says, well, first, by your pure and respectful behavior. And when he says pure, he means sexually pure, as a good witness. And respectful in the sense that the submissive, um, that the submission, rather, is sincere and not merely lip service. And then he says, <clears throat> confidence. Isn't that strange? He, he mixes the idea of you know, winning over with a good example, you know, respect, so on and so forth, and confidence, <clears throat> that he would mention confidence. See, submission doesn't mean slavery. A Christian woman has character and strength and peace which are her inner beauty. These are the things she concentrates on rather than the outward beauty. Now I've seen people take this passage and you know, extrapolate here that women are not allowed, Christian women are not allowed to wear jewelry, they can't wear nice clothes, they can't you know, have their hair done, you know, they must never cut their hair, no jewelry, no makeup, you know, again, just bad, that's just bad Bible interpretation, bad exegesis. It's not what he's saying. He's saying, do not let these type of things be the only things that you're working on. The exterior stuff. He doesn't say don't do that. He's saying don't let this be the focus. The focus, rather, that will draw her husband in to loving her, to being drawn by her spirituality, are the qualities that she works on on the inside, her sexual purity, her respect, her courage. She's not afraid because there are plenty of things that happen in life that can make a woman afraid. And this woman, this Christian woman here, she's, she's not afraid. She has confidence in the future, confidence in herself, confidence in her faith. These are the things that her husband will notice and that he will continue to cherish long after the outward beauty will fade. Let's face it, right? We, all, we were all skinny and good looking at one time in our life. Well, maybe not Bud, but you know. <clears throat> right. <laughs> so so he, he, he uses Sarah as an example. You know, Sarah, he says, she was a woman like this, and it was, for, it was her strength and peace that enabled her to submit to Abraham, not her fear. A woman has to be confident to be able to submit herself to her husband for the sake of her faith. That requires strength to do that, not weakness. So in 3.7 he says, you husbands, and I talk to the husband, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Notice many, many verses, complex, nuanced verses for the women, just one verse for the guys. You know, let's keep it simple for the guys, right? He speaks to Christian husbands on the flip side of the issue. Pagan husbands will act as they will with only the Christian attitude of their wives to save them. But Christian husbands, however, have the responsibility to know, know meaning to understand their wives and the special needs that they have because they are women and mothers and asked by God to submit to their husbands. A husband, a Christian husband, needs to understand that his wife is in submission to him by choice. She has taken this great responsibility and placed it into his hands. And he needs to make an effort at understanding what that feels like what that, the, the, the value of that gift and the responsibility that he has. Weaker, of course, weaker, not mentally weaker, weaker like he's 190, six foot two or you know, whatever, and she's five foot two, uh, you know, I never say a woman's weight, but anyways, a lot less than him. Weaker in that way, that, that's all he's saying. You need to remember your wife is a weaker person than you. And so not to carefully provide that understanding and that care, he says, is to hinder their own spiritual lives. You know what the best compliment a wife can give to her husband? The very best? 
It's not, oh honey, you're so strong. You're so, you know, big strong guy. I just love the way you drive your truck. That's not the best compliment a woman can give a man, her husband. The best compliment a woman can give, a, a, a wife can give her husband is this, honey, you know me so well. When your wife says to you, sweetie, you just know me so well. You're, you're in the zone, buddy. You're in the zone. She's giving you the highest of compliments. It means you're paying attention. You're knowing what she's thinking and what she's needing from you. So submission doesn't mean slavery, and Peter reminds men of the equal value and rewards that God sees women as having. And in the context of grace, the subject matter we're talking about, grace enables a woman to willfully accept a role that she would normally reject or overthrow with her intelligence and guile. No woman says, you know what, I think I want to grow up in order to be in submission to a man. No, who thinks like that? It's a willful thing. It's a gift given. Why? Because God has asked. And the same grace enables a man to keep in check his natural tendency to dominate by force one who is weaker. When a woman understands that her husband will never, ever, under any circumstances, use his superior physical strength to get his way, when she knows that 100% true, then the husband has neutralized that thing about himself in order to give his wife confidence. He'll use his strength to protect her. He'll use his strength to build their home. He'll use his strength, even give his life to cover her, but he will never use it to harm her. That's the submission that men give to their wives. They lay aside the one tool, the one thing they have where they could win every time and they lay it down, never to pick it up and use it against their wives. So submission is God's way of guaranteeing balance and peace in the family until Jesus returns. And then there will only be one family and no need for this. So let me just kind of summarize here very quickly before we, uh, before we finish. Peter tracks the various effects on one's life as God's grace leads the believer to experience a new spirit of submission. So this change will include a willingness to accept and submit to authority when it has been established by God, whether it's in society or in our careers or in our homes, in our marriages. This new attitude makes for a good witness for Christ wherever we are, and it guarantees peace and harmony which are pleasing to God. We want peace and harmony in our nation. We want peace and harmony in our careers. We want peace and harmony in our families. Why? Because we've got this tunnel thing here. We've got a job to do, and the job we have to do is to win others for Christ. The job we have to do as a group is to spread the gospel and, and to nurture those in the faith and to keep them faithful until the Lord returns. That's the thing that we've got to do. And when there's chaos and rebellion and war and all those things, whether it be in the government or in our homes, we can't do that job. We're just too busy staying alive physically. So Peter says, if we don't know how to submit, Christians, well, you know, there's no hope for the world to even learn how to do this. All right, so that's this part of uh, First Peter, our third lesson. We're going to continue next time. Uh, I do encourage you to you know, read ahead. It makes a whole lot more sense if you've read a couple of passages, a couple of chapters ahead, and 
you know, we come back and we drill deeper down into the meaning of it. All right, that's it, thank you, we're dismissed. <laughs>